Well, it's nice to see you all again. Um, so I'm going to talk to you about this project that we started two years ago, which is focused on monitoring road salt pollution in Adirondack streams. And as I was sitting uh, listening to Stuart and Mike, I started scribbling down notes. I was like, oh, I gotta, I gotta change this. I gotta add that. But I'm not going to do that. But I'm, what I'm going to try to do is to, to, if I can remember, try to incorporate some of the some of the things that they said into my presentation because there were some very interesting, uh, very interesting uh, factoids presented and concepts presented by, uh, particularly by Stuart, but also by, by Mike. So what I'm going to do is first spend a little time giving you some background information, talking about the road networks and road cell use in the outer round decks. Then I'm going to talk about a, this, this project that Lee alluded to, uh, where we basically did a project where we were looking at regional salinization of lakes by road salt, which was really our setup for the work that we're doing now with streams. So it's kind of the justification for the work. And, you know, I'm going to spend a fair amount of time describing our project. I think it's important for for you to see uh, really the amount of effort it does take to, to design a, a, a long-term monitoring project to look at the effects of something like road runoff on, on stream water chemistry. And then I will share with you some findings from the project and then some key results. I should have, after Stuart started his presentation, his results, I should have done the same thing, but, but uh, I'll, I'll save mine uh, for the end. So that'll be that. All right, so the Adirondack Park uh, has a very extensive network of paved roads. We have 2,834 lane, lane miles of uh, state roads shown in red, and these are uh, a combination of interstates, so it would be 87, uh, U.S. highways like 9, and uh, state roads like Route 30 and Route 3. And as, as already has been mentioned, uh, these roads are all uh, maintained using uh, standard protocols through the New York State Department of Transportation. So they're very consistently uh, treated when we think about winter road management. We also have uh, the Adirondack Park Trail Network, which is the largest network of paved roads in the United States. So that includes the Adirondack Trail Network, 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 and unlike state roads, these are treated using a variety of management techniques. We think now we have 105 towns and villages in, in the Adirondacks. We don't have 105 different possibilities, but we have a lot more variation in terms of, of the management of our local roads compared to the state. In terms of road stock application, our state roads receive, on average, 98,000 tons of sodium chloride salt per year in the Adirondacks. And this would divide out to an average application rate of 34 tons per lane model per year. And uh, Mike showed you the, the map, where sort of Europe is in the area where we have, uh, what's the term of ice? Winter severity? Winter severity, yeah, the high winter severity, so, so that certainly reflects the highway. New York is, has the highest low salt application. Local roads also have road salt applied and about 76,900 tons per year on local roads. And this will divide out to an average rate of 10 tons per lane mile uh, per year. Now, but this number is a little bit misleading because as, as, as we all know and we probably all observe that, and just go back to the point I made on the previous slide, local roads really do receive a variety of treatments. Some are just plowed. Some are plowed and sanded. Some are plowed and sanded with a little bit of salt. Some are plowed and sanded with different ratios of, of sand to salt. And some are, are, are uh, plowed and salted following similar, similar protocols to the state. So there's a lot more variation in local road treatment. And that's going to come to bear in a little bit in terms of uh, results, our key result for our lake project and how we design our stream. Now, these are big numbers. So 98,000 tons of salt on state roads, 76,900 uh, 76, tons of salt on local roads. I want to put these numbers in perspective uh, with one of our other uh, regional pollutants that we're all familiar with, and that would be acid deposition. So we have this graph, we've got the kilotons here, so it's 150,000 tons. We have the road salt load, which would be the salt. 
sum of uh, state and local roads, so uh, 100, 170,000 tons per year. And this is the sum of the inputs of nitrate and sulfate in acid deposition. So our, our other region of fluids, you can see, you can see that that road salt load, which we're putting on the roads uh, deliberately, is about six times higher than the acid deposition. So that's a significant, that's a significant input. Uh, and it's interesting, we know, uh, we know comparatively little about the environmental effects of road salting uh, relative to what we know about the environmental effects of acid deposition. Acid deposition has been, been quite widely researched. So a big load on, on our roads that we know we don't know a whole lot about in terms of this, in terms of this regional environment. We couple this uh, with a high connectivity of our waters to our paved road networks. Now this is the result of a study that um, we just finished and was now in review, looking at the connectivity of paved road surfaces to streams and lakes, basically modeling based on topography the runoff of water, the potential runoff of water into surface water. You can see here, we have 77% of the surface water area and 52% of the streamline in the Adirondack Park is what we call hydrologically connected to our paper. So that's, you take that high load, you combine that with a high connectivity, we have the potential at least for a serious amount of environmental degradation from, from this so, cause for concern. So what have we done up to this point is sort of, sort of realize, realize the potential. And our first, our first look at this was to conduct our regional study on lake stabilization, which if anybody's interested, I can send you a copy of, of the paper that we wrote on this. But in this study, what we used was a data set that we put together of 138 lakes, uh, many from the Adirondack Watershed Institute, a combined data set from different sources, uh, and the other lakes from the Adirondack Lake Survey Corporation, which is a quasi-state uh, organization based out of Raybrook that's uh, focused on, on monitoring lakes related to acid deposition. What we did is we delineated the watersheds for all 138 of these lakes, so the drainage area for each lake. And then we determined the density uh, the presence and the density of, of paved roads in each of these watersheds. So what we ended up with was 56 lakes and watersheds with no paved roads, and 82 lakes and watersheds with paved roads. What we're doing here is we're basically using paved roads as a surrogate for roads. So, so assuming that paved roads get the result. So I'm just going to show you two results from this project. First, we'll look at the median lake salt concentration. So we have, and this will be sodium and chloride, so it will be blue, chloride, and green. And the ion concentration on the y-axis. First, we'll look at the no-road scenario. So this is 56, 56 lakes. So it's a pretty good size data set. We see that both the sodium and chloride ion concentrations are, are quite low. Uh, Stuart, I think you had like 10, was sort of 10 parts per million, was, was sort of a guide. And here, here in the Adirondacks, and we say in our paper, our, our guide for, for what we call least impacted waters, so, so really no, no development, uh, no other sources of inputs other than deposition and, and natural processes in the watershed, uh, the sodium concentration would be around a half a part per million, and the chloride, and the chloride concentration would be about 0.25 milligrams per liter, so, so quite low, well. and reflecting in the case of chloride, we just don't have natural, uh, significant natural sources of chloride in our rock. So, so that would be sedimentary rock, we don't have, we don't have a sedimentary rock, or our rocks don't have, have that chloride. So, so very low, very low natural, natural concentrations, and less chloride than so. Compare this to our roads. So here we're looking at the median from across the data set. These bars are 95% confidence intervals for both sets. 
And you can see there's no significantly higher concentration in the weights for both sodium and chloride, uh, about seven times higher for sodium and 15 times roughly higher uh, for chloride. And notice how they switch. So, so now chloride is the dominant ion, uh, and sodium is the second, and this is, uh, relates to the salt. So, so salt has a higher uh, chloride concentration in terms of its, in terms of its uh, milligrams uh, per mole uh, weight, molecular weight versus, versus sodium. So we're going to have, have that switch. But also notice, uh, if you look at the median, I'm just kind of thinking back to Stuart's, uh, the median uh, weight would be around 7. So it's still uh, relatively low if we think about the green light, yellow, and red light stuff. But notice we have this have this variability. And this variation is, is largely explained by the density of state roads in these watersheds. Again, state road density is a surrogate for, for road salt. More roads in the watershed, greater salt, salt flows. So we can see we have the ion concentration on the y-axis, milligrams per liter, and we have the density of the roads and lane miles per, per square mile. And for both ions, for chloride and sodium, state road density explains 84% of the variability. That's a pretty good relationship, we would say, in environmental research, to have one variable, the density of the roads and the water, to explain 84% of the variation. Another interesting outcome from this work was lower roads explain none of the variation. There was no, no relationship between ion concentration variation in ion concentration and the density of all the roads in, in these waters. Why? Goes back to what the point I made earlier. Local roads, yes, yeah, some are salted, but they receive such a wide array of, of treatments in terms of winter road management that we don't see as a clean relationship like we do for state roads that are all consistently treated with sodium chloride. So, uh, so this was a, an important finding. This helped drive uh, some, some help drive to some extent the work that's being done with the salt test areas in the Adirondack Park. Provides some justification, justification certainly for focusing on uh, reducing salt loadings on state roads since they are the largest contributor to the, to the variability in high concentration. So this this was important. But we realized uh, through this work that even though we do the lake monitoring, we, we can detect the signal, if you will, of road salt pollution uh, in our lakes. Lake system really isn't the best system for us to be studying to really understand the severity of, of road salt impacts on the environment. Stuart was looking at streams. And why, why is the lake the best system? You guys look out the window out there, so that's that St. Regis, Lower St. Regis Lake. Uh, the watershed for, for Lower St. Regis Lake is largely forest preserved with very little development. Uh, only a small proportion of that watershed actually has road going through it that's salt. So the end result of that is, is the salt water is coming, salt water certainly is making its way into the into Lake Bear runoff, but most of the water is coming in from natural areas and diluting it out. So we have a lot of dilution happening in, in the lake systems that we monitor, which damages our ability to really look at the effect of salt and severity. So, so we moved <coughs> to streams. So we started our stream monitoring project. And it has two main objectives. First is to look at the effects of salt load on water quality. And also, actually, soil fertility. I left that off because we can't talk about that today. But we're also interested in the effects of road salt application on soils. And our second objective is to be able to inform management through, really through the first. If we can develop relationships between the road salt flows, how much is applied.
are the streams for each of these watersheds, and we determine the density of the roads within each. And then we selected watersheds for study based on three criteria. First, we wanted watersheds that are, that are just draining forest preserve. One of the nice things about studying here in the Adirondacks is we can eliminate some of those other sources that Stuart was talking about. We can, we can focus on forest preserve as our, as our least impacted a watershed condition. Then, all these selected watersheds are state roads. Reason being is, is we know how they're treated versus local roads we, we don't know. So we want to remove that uncertainty. And then we want to bridge the culverts if we can get them for, for actually getting real local discharge measures. So based on these criteria, we're always within the limits of available funding, uh, we selected 16 watersheds, and we had three, three water, or, sorry, four watersheds that are what we call least impacted. These are reference watersheds uh, against which we compare the, the effect of uh, road density. And then the rest of them, the rest as well, will span the entire range of state road density in the study area. So from point, probably point one to a little over four lane miles per square mile. And we try to space them apart as even as we could. Uh, so what we have now is what we call a response group. So we can look at, imagine on the y-axis, instead of a number of watersheds, we've got uh, chloride concentration, or sodium, or something else as a function of state, state road density. So we can actually model, uh, look at and model uh, that road density. And, and once we have road salt data, which we have from the DOT, we can actually put salt load on there. So this is where our work is going on. So each of those little symbols is a study location. And you can see on the inset, actually the work is pretty good, pretty good amount of the northeastern quadrant of the Adirondack. So it's spatially uh, pretty, pretty wide. And here we are at Allspence, okay, so that, that's our local geographic location. We have four streams that we're monitoring that are within the DOT test area. So we have two Indian Ferry and Sentinel <coughs> Brook, which are on the Route 3 test area. We have one Sentinel Brook, which is on the 86 test area, and we have Cascade Brook on, on Route 73. So we're able to, this is great, so we're able to get the, the data from the DOT and, and collaborate and bring their information into the stream monitoring. And here are the four the four least impacted streams uh, located or outlined in blue. Show you this, one of our designs here is we wanted to have these easily or well distributed through the study area so we can get a good sense of the natural variation in, in stream chemistry across the area. Okay, so in terms of the setup, we have so we have 16 watersheds, and each one has, has instrumentation that's actually collecting data on a 30 minute time interval. So 10 o'clock, 10 30, 11 o'clock. Uh, we have a level log, which is measuring the height of the stream, which we need to figure out the discharge. We have a connectivity logger, here's one, here's one here that's in the stream. And uh, connectivity is a great way for us to monitor salt. Uh, pure water, as you probably know, is a poor conductor of electricity. Start to mix a little salt in, the connectivity goes up. So it's a very strong relationship. So we have a logger in there, each stream pair with a level logger to measure connectivity on a high resolution of 30 minutes. And it, we installed these in the fall of, of 12, and they've been recording data ever since. So we've actually got two winters of data. Uh, we probably get any more. And then on a, on a bi weekly or event basis, we go out and collect. Samples. So we collect the water sample. We also measure in stream temperature and conductivity, which we need to do to check the performance of our loggers and do calibrations if necessary. And we also measure stream discharge so we can develop what we call a rating curve. Right, so back in the lab, we also measure conductivity again on the sample. And we determine the concentration of the ions in the water. Uh, so chloride, so the sodium chloride, and the negative. We also look at the concentrations of the cations, calcium, magnesium, potassium, and sodium. Uh, the other three cations, calcium, magnesium, potassium, related to soil fertility, we're not talking about today, but sodium, again, related to uh, road salt, sodium chloride. So then what we do is we develop curves. So we have what's called a calibration curve, and this is just an example. This thing is brilliant. 
And then we can use that equation to estimate the field concentration on 30 minute intervals. So we have really high resolution estimates of ion concentration. And then the last thing we can do is we can actually, what we really want to do is figure out the export of ions from the watershed to get the concentration time to discharge. We don't have that yet. It takes a long time to develop the, what we call the rating curves to be able to get a good export estimate. So if we don't have that, I won't talk about that part today. We'll focus on concentration. All right, some findings. Basically, I'm going to show you three sets of findings. First, we'll look at ion concentration, then we'll look at time series, uh, so the fluctuation in conductivity and, and actually chloride through time, and we're going to look at the DOT tester. So for concentration, we have 26 events that we sampled, uh, 442 samples, and this spans uh, April of 13 through August of this year, that's April of 13, when our funding came through to start the project. So that's why we started that. Alright, so what I want to do is show you the same two results that I showed you for lakes. The median concentrations of sodium chloride and then the relationship between those concentrations and density. So we have ion concentration on the Y. In this case, we have N equals 4 for no rows. Take a look. Uh, yeah, very low concentration. Actually, these are the same. One, but a 0.5 and 0.25. So, so very consistent uh, with what we're getting. At least in fact, it makes, it makes sense that they should be similar. And what's nice about here too is these are these are confidence intervals uh, with real time. So we so we have uh, very very low variability between these these impacted streams. So they really serve as a great benchmark against which us. For us, for us to compare uh, the roads. We look at the roads, in light of lakes, we have significantly higher concentration. Uh, again, 95% confidence intervals for medians. More chloride than sodium, uh, just like with lakes, but a much larger difference in terms of magnitude. So here we have, so the median sodium for lakes, I think, was around 3. Here it's up versus Sodium is, and, and chloride is, was about 13, now it's about 30. So a much larger difference. Why? Well, we're up in the watershed. We're up there with the source of the road salt pollution that's happening. So, so uh, that's by design. We wanted to increase our sensitivity to actually be able to see the environmental effects before the, the, the lake diluted out salt. We have this variation in these ions, and that's related to density. So here, uh, here we get here this, this through the origin. Uh, but we have ion concentration on the Y, and just like with lakes, a, a strong relationship with concentration, uh, or rather with a road density. 87% for sodium, 83% for, for chloride. Uh, so very consistent, but again, the slopes are steeper. So, so that meaning that change in concentration per unit of change in road density is, is, is higher than we have. Okay, I just want to compare, I want to compare the chloride to a couple of other studies. Um, there's not a lot of, there's a few studies out there that are similar to ours in terms of relating stream chemistry to road density. There are two in the Northeast that, that I want to compare to ours. So we're the Adirondack Smoky Maxon. Uh, we have a study in New Hampshire by Daly. I looked at uh, chloride concentration as a function of road density. We have a study in Rhode Island by Nemirovsky Waldron that looked at the same, same thing. Now, uh, severity, winter severity is lower in Rhode Island, right? In New Hampshire, it's, it's similar. And in the other outbreaks, it's Just me? Maybe I can't see red. Um, so 
So anyway, we have, have these three studies that we can compare, in, all in the Northeast. So we'll just look at their, their uh, chloride, just adopt to really small. The chloride concentration, just like we saw before. Here's our row density, that all has a similar range and density. Here's our line for the Adirondacks, notice a much steeper slope. And Rhode Island is less slope, New Hampshire is less slope. And actually, the relationships aren't as good either, so, so a little bit more variation. Uh, why this relates to how much salt they actually have similar, the soils are coarse textured stony soils. So, so in terms of their drainage, their retention, they're similar uh, in quotes, uh, but they differ largely in the salt application rate. So we're seeing that reflected in their concentrations. These are median concentrations in terms of uh, 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 road density in the other right. So now let's look at some time series results. We'll look at conductance, which is measured, and we'll look at chloride, which is estimated. So that'll be for a longer time series. Uh, first, specific conductance. Specific conductance, again, don't care about the units. The higher the number, the higher the salt in the water. And we're looking at time, so these are months, November, December, etc. I want to start by showing you the conducting of precipitation. So we have an atmospheric monitoring station here on campus, uh, where on a weekly basis we measure conductivity. So this is the conductivity of, of the water, essentially, that's coming into our water. And we would expect that uh, that would be the lowest conductivity that we would experience uh, as we're measuring water going through the watershed and down to our stream. So it's a nice benchmark against which to look at the other part of the planet. So it varies from a low of about uh, 5 to a high of about 25, and the mean is, is just over 10 microsieverts per second. This is the average conductivity of our streams. Uh, in the least impacted areas. So, so our uh, four, this is the mean of four uh, time series. Uh, so you can see it, you know, it's higher, which makes sense. The water's moving through the watershed, uh, it's picking up this all the line out and export it out the stream. We expect the conductivity to go up. And if the range is from a low of about 18, the high is about 48, and the mean is roughly 32. So we have this increase uh, uh, for the least impacted conditions. The variability. Uh, we have, if I put stage on here, you see that which the stream height, they're inversely related. So, so as stream, basically as stream flow increases, we get dilution constantly goes down and, and vice versa. So we see that inverse relationship. So, not so. All right, so now let's look at conductance with roads. So we have, putting a couple more things on here. Here are our salting, called salting seeds. So we have 12, 13, this pink, 13, 14, this pink. So we have two winter road salting seasons on the air conductivity. Here is the, so this is the least impacted one I just showed you on. You can see kind of where this is going. Uh, that's the least impacted condition conductivity. This is the average, this is the average con conductance of our other 12. Okay, so we're just looking at an average here. Uh, so first thing you notice, we have a shift in the baseline. So, so our minimum conductance is at least double, if not triple, the conductance of under the least impacted condition. So this is evidence where we have salts accumulated. We have salts have accumulated in these watersheds, elevating the minimum conductivity uh, of the streams. And Stuart has the question of, you know, are we seeing groundwater contamination? Are we seeing retention? So we're seeing retention. Maybe we don't know exactly where it is, but this is a strong evidence that we have retention when we see consistent it's an elevated baseline. Uh, another thing that we see is in both, in the winter, we see peaks. So distinct peaks uh, in both years associated with thawing, micro thawing events uh, with that salt laden snow with the, with the uh, water moving into the streams. And then we have our connectivity in, in the summertime. So that's that picture. Now I want to shift the picture and look at chloride. This is something. So Stuart gave us some sorts of benchmarks for chloride concentrations related to toxicity. So here, I just want to remind you what we do. 
do here, we measure conductance, we predict chlorine. So, but we have we developed the relationships in the lab, and we use this equation uh, to estimate chloride concentration in the field. So, what I wanted to show you now is that estimated chloride concentration as a function of time. Again, we've got the two salting seasons, and what I have on here, uh, I'm going to stack some time series. We have no roads. In parentheses, this would be 0.8. Million miles per square mile, one, three, three point eight million miles per square mile. So an increase in uh, road density is what that's when we can see here. So here is no roads at the scale. Okay, so it's it's low. And, and based on you know basically it's never getting above one milligram per liter. And that's what we're seeing in our day. Uh, this will be our minimum road density. What, what I want you to be looking, focusing in on here is is shift in the baseline. So, so is the peaking is the lowest level conductivity starting to separate out. And also look at the variability to get it, because they're getting more they're getting more variable. So we see a slight shift at a lowest density. Uh, next highest density, we see more elevation, more, more variability, uh, a little bit more with the next one, and then some more with the next one. A couple of things I want to point out here. Uh, first, let's look at year to year. Um, you know, Mike already mentioned that it, had, it was quite a wind last winter, and so, so we had more salt, and we see that certainly we see that reflected. So higher higher concentrations of chloride estimated in terms of episodic peaks uh, in 13, 14 versus the 12, 13. So we certainly see that reflected. The peaks are higher. The higher the density. Also, we notice one of the focus, just like Stuart did, on tennis. Look at the purple su summertime. There you go. So, the summertime. So, we actually see uh, elevation. So, if we kind of draw an arc through here, kind of through the noise, we see the chloride concentration increasing through the summertime at the highest, highest growth. <laughs> And I would interpret that as actually, uh, you know, as, we, as we go through the summer, the stream flow is decreasing, and most of that stream flow is coming from what we call basin, which is typically around. And so I would interpret this, not knowing anything else, that that increase that we're seeing in the summertime is evidence of chloride being in ground, at least shallow ground. So feeding feeding that uh, uh, stream with higher chloride levels. And you can see we have over 10, 100,000 in the numbers. So, so we're in those, in those ranges. Uh, certainly, uh, we're getting peaks above 100, upside peaks above 100 uh, on several occasions. The question is, is acute versus chronic is the, the issue. Uh, here is our highest growth density. I'd have to the other one to do it in the other. So this, this is in the interior, carry, put on, so squash everything else down. And we can see for this one, um, a much more dramatic difference in terms of the concentrations. And we see it, if we're in the carry, actually our summer concentrations are higher than our winter concentrations compared to the first year. I don't have this summer yet, uh, unfortunately. Uh, but, so see the winter here, we kind of average that out with the lower than in the summer, which is something that Stuart, Stuart talked about when he gave his presentation. And look at the peaks. So these are episodic peaks. Uh, this past winter, over 1,200 milligrams per liter. So that's an urban. That's those are urban peaks. Urban peaks in the Adirondack watershed. That only has roads. So uh, that that's I find that remarkable. So if we, you know, are we is, are we ahead of the curve? I don't know. I'm not, I'm not so sure if we are or not. It sort of depends on the road density. Uh, in, in the watersheds, higher road densities uh, were not uh, I don't think. So we are seeing episodic high concentrations of chloride. Uh, in All right, so let's look at the DOT test areas. This will be the last thing. We're going to look at the chloride time series. Actually, we'll look at the same, the same one I just showed you, but think about it a little differently. 
then we're going to look at chloride and salt, those, which is related to the second objective of the project. So again, this is related to these four locations. So, so these are the areas where the DOT has been doing their tests and has, have been recording the actual salt application data at the time the trucks go out, so we have really good information on the actual loads for, for the uh, road. So this kind of this kind of this emphasizes what the point that Mike made last night was cold. So th this is summarizing some statistics uh, from our weather station here at the college, comparing last winter to the previous winter, and just uh, just uh, quickly, so 2013, 14 versus 12, 13 season. On average, it was 70 degrees, 7 degrees Fahrenheit cooler. Uh, we had only 21% of the days above freezing versus 34 in the previous winter. We had an average uh, days of week above freezing was just over one versus over two. And we had a maximum of a month between thaws and last winter, which was one week. So not only do these differences affect how much salt is going to be applied to the roads to manage them for safety, they also affect the dynamics of how that salt is released uh, from the watershed. So just quickly, uh, if we think about this year, 2013, uh, we had more, more thaw days, and they were, they were more evenly dispersed. We're going to get more gradual release of salt from the watersheds. We're going to have peaks, but perhaps they're going to be s smaller than if the salt builds up and gets released in a, in a big pulp. Uh, versus, so if you look at 13, 14, salt is going to accumulate and then be released less free. So what does this winter mean? <laughs> Every year is different. Uh, so related to, uh, related to the differences in winter, and Mike talked about this, uh, here we're looking at the data expressed on tons of salt per square mile of water. So we have the Group three test water um, test watersheds, 86 test watershed, and Route 73 test watershed, Cascade. And what I did is, is so we have a watershed area, we have a, the main mile of the state road within each of the watersheds. We know the uh, the application and we'll talk, apply for the lane mile based on the DOT data. We just multiply that their per lane mile by our lane miles, divide that by the surface area of the watershed. So, so we get a load times for each. So the variability you see between them, the, the location is a function of how much road there is in the watershed and how big the watershed. So notice we have a large difference between years. So in 13 and 14, 38% more salt applied on the Route 3 test site compared to 12 13. So that's a lot more salt. And then for the 86, we had 15% more. <coughs> Cascade, we don't have 12 years of data, so we don't know. It probably, probably was more than we would, we would get. So this is a big difference uh, in terms of how much salt was put down. And um, this really illustrates one of the challenges. And, you know, Mike mentioned this. Uh, salt is applied based on the weather. You know, so we have differences, differences in the weather day to day. And we have large differences year to year. <coughs> Uh, so, we're going to get more or less salt use. Um, this really makes it a challenge trying to figure out how to optimize, say, a road salt application rate with environmental concerns. If salt is applied based on the weather, which it is. And just to illustrate that, we'll just focus on Indian Carry again. And here we have chloride concentration for the interior on the Y. We've got our time in, in months on the X. Again, we've got our two salting seasons. The red line is the chloride time series. The black bars, those are individual salting units. So, so uh, then the higher bar would be more, more salt. So you can see when the salt was applied uh, during during each of those each of those years. And uh, so it's no news to those who do the work, but I was like, wow, look at how many times they go up. <laughs> uh, but, but yeah, so you know, almost continuously through, through the winter, uh, salt is being applied. Uh, and here is the total total amount each year, so 171 times versus 236, reflecting the differences in severity of those two winters. So if you look within, if you look within the uh, 
it's the colder part of the winter, so December, January, February, and compared to two, they look similar in terms of the dynamics. Where they look different is when you get to the spring. So we had April, so we can focus on April of 13, 12, 13 versus April of 13, 14. 12, 13, it was going down to our concentration. 13, 14, it was spiking way up. So we had differences in those dynamics. And this relates partly to where there's more salt applied in 13, 14, but also that salt accumulated. And it was released in, in thaws in the spring versus being released more incrementally through, through the winter in the previous year. You can kind of see that incremental release in 12, 13, kind of look at uh, these are kind of going up. We had thaws and, uh, and, and more release. So again, this just illustrates, um, and actually you can see nicely on, on this one since it's just this, this uh, particular site this summer. So the increased chloride concentration uh, as Stuart mentioned in the summer. So this is a good example of where um, the application of the salt is dictated by, by uh, the need uh, to clear the roads make the road safe uh, is combined with the variability in the weather uh, really uh, has an impact on, on stream chemistry. And so it's hard to manage if we want to, uh, if we want to keep the peaks low. You know, so if we, if we don't want to have chloride peaks greater than 600 milligrams per liter, how are we going to manage that? You know, if, if this year is, if the weather really drives uh, the dynamics of release and the amount of salt that's going on. Well, that's a challenge. Uh, okay, so the last thing I want to look at, uh, our second objective was trying to inform management. So can we relate these loads that we calculated to high end concentrations of water? The question. And we can. So this is the average chloride concentration for, for uh, each of those four uh, areas for each winter. There is a total amount of sodium chloride that is applied for each one. And we can see a nice relationship uh, where lower extremes 90% of variability in chloride. So, so this is a potentially powerful, useful tool as it develops for if we want to meet certain water quality standards. So if we want, want to say uh, we would like to have the average chloride concentration be 100 milligrams per liter. Figured out somehow from the literature that that's an acceptable concentration to to minimize environmental impacts on say on aquatic life. Uh, if that's what we want, we come across. We can see if we stay below 175 tons of salt per square mile, we should achieve that target. So that's the idea here is to be able to provide this just example, uh, provide this kind of relationship to help inform the management. So let's, uh, let's wrap it up. So this way to the last slide. So we do have this positive relationship with road density and results for solid. Now we have salt load from the previous slide, so we can see directly the relationship there. Um, we are observing high event concentration. So our maximum chloride for one of our sites is 1,200 milligrams and the question is, are biological thresholds being exceeded? And you know, based on Stewart's presentation, we would say, oh, <laughs> or yes. Um, you know, event would relate to a cheat, right? So that would be an acute effect. So an uh, organism being hit with a high concentration that's going to have, a, have, a, have an acute effect on the organism. So it appears that biological thresholds are being exceeded. We're also observing high, what I call base flow concentrations as, as road density increases, as salt load increases. We see higher concentrations in the summer. Uh, and we're, our actually maximum is around 200 milligrams per liter. So as Stuart mentioned, the optimum, that summertime is, is that time, right? That where the biological activity is, is active, that's when the higher salt concentration may cause the most harm. And so if we're seeing high base flow concentrations upwards of 200 milligrams per liter, that may be a cause for concern in biological for chronic, for really for chronic effects to the aquatic ecosystem. I also put a question mark on groundwater. So, so is that higher base flow concentration of 
chloride indicates to us that we have contaminated ground. Um, another take home is uh, because of the differences in weather, uh, we're dictating the amount of salt that's used and also affecting the release of the salt in the watershed. We have a lot of variability, a lot of year to year variation in the concentrations, and that, that's just an example. That's the mean concentration for one of the sites from one year to the next, 95 and 138. Uh, so the question is, I don't have to answer, uh, how, how do we manage the application of, of a chemical de icer? We don't have to just talk about the part. How do we manage the application of a de icer given, from an environmental perspective, given that we're going to, we know we're going to experience the period? And lastly, uh, actually this relates to Stuart's point too. Uh, I was about to uh, nitrate. So we have uh, our, our ambient or our background chloride concentration that released in hydrogen conditions is about a quarter of a kilogram. In all of our study watersheds where we have roads, we see uh, chloride concentrations much greater than one, than one milliliter. Uh, so, the question is, chloride's a tracer. Okay, so if you see elevated chloride, there's other stuff running off those roads into the water. So what else, the question is, what else, question mark, what else is in the road if chloride's a tracer? All right, so quickly acknowledge Adirondack Action, who actually, you know, we've been a partner in this for a while. They actually provided us the seed money to start our stream monitoring project. I acknowledge, protect the Adirondacks, Peter's here. We've got this great collaborative project along with volunteers with Lake Monitoring, which provided a lot of the information for this report that we did. Uh, Lake Champlain Basin Program provided us with funding to buy it, a bunch of these to put in our streams. Uh, Natural Resource, or Northern Eastern States Research Cooperative is where we're receiving our funding for our actual monitoring of the streams. DOT for, for sharing your information with us. And uh, Corey is right there, uh, my co-author. And these two gentlemen, Brandon, Maury, and Sean Patton, who are in the back of the room, are, are doing all the 